brought to you by Prescient Investment Management. Informed by science, guided by insight. Prescient Investment Management is an authorized FSP. Welcome to Honest Money. We're talking all things data today, uh, and, and data is a big, uh, it's a small word for a very big field. Uh, you know, d- data is kind of a big theme in the, in the world around uh, artificial intelligence, around retail, around investing, around manufacturing, uh, and, and never before, I think, has the world collected so much data so quickly. Uh, and and it is a complex and fast moving field, and I certainly don't feel qualified to to sit here and uh, explain the world of of data in, in in any accuracy. So I've brought in some backup, Shreya Roy, who's a quantitative analyst at Prescient. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Warren. Happy to be here. So so I think it, maybe just to start, we you know I can I can see it in the in the world uh, of investing around. Um, just us collecting data about our clients and and you know share prices and and then we're getting fed you know by, by Bloomberg about what's going on all around the world and and data is becoming I think more freely available but but also a lot cheaper and more accessible for people whereas in the past uh, you know you bought a book and it cost hundreds or thousands of rands and 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 information that was valuable was in there and it took six months to get to your desk we're we're long past that now uh, and. And so what, what, what interests me about the world of data is how much of the stuff that we're collecting is actually valuable and how much of it is garbage? Mm. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think we're so privileged to actually live in this era, um, to be able to open our phones and to quickly Google something. Um, we've got so much access to this data and it can be overwhelming. Um, and I think What we need to remember is that just because we've got access to all this data, not all of it is actually good. Um, Having a lot of data doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make a more accurate decision. Um, What you have to do is actually, you know, work through this data. You've got to understand where it's coming from. Um, You've got to ask lots of questions. I think it's like anything in life. You know, you can't just take things at face value. You've got to question it. And I think this, it it reminds me of um, during COVID when everyone started sharing these WhatsApp messages, you know, they started forwarding stuff, crazy stats, um, and people would freak out and they'd get super overwhelmed. Um, But it's because they just read it and they believe it. Um, And I think that's something that we really need to be careful of. We've got to be skeptical. We've got to have, um, you know, we've got to be responsible when when we're looking at anything. Um, And I think that's, that's an important lesson. Yeah. So, so you're talking about something that's really close to my heart. You know, these, uh, you know, just general social media data uh, that that gets spewed at us, and and it's, you know, we, I think data is kind of a, 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 it's being generous. Some some of it's just real rubbish. Uh, and w- mm-hmm. what's interesting to me about it is a lot of it is um, we we filter. Sometimes we filter the news that we get from mainstream media better than we do a forwarded WhatsApp from a friend or a family member or somebody somehow, like if it's coming from somebody, you know, and you love, uh, th- then you just yeah. assume that that's gospel. And, and that for me is quite frightening, you know, because uh, I, I mean, you know, you know, WhatsApp is absolutely no source of anything uh, in terms of a guarantee of quality. It's, I mean, it, it, it could just be a blank piece of paper. You know, it's a, it, to, me, yeah. to me, it's electronic piece of uh, blank paper. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think, I think a lot of organizations, I mean, it depends where you are. I think if I would just compare the investment world to something like a retailer, um, I think in the investment world, when we look at data, we're actually quite lucky. And I think, you know, if you spoke to any analyst, they'd probably complain and say, oh, we spend 70 to 80 percent of the time just working with this data before we can actually implement it in a model or, or in a project. But I think what we forget is that we're actually very lucky because the data that we're getting is from, uh, for example, Bloomberg. Um, so it's a data provider and, and we pay for it. So we expect this data to already have been um, cleaned, to have be in the format that we need it in. So there's kind of, there's a little less work that we need to do to actually, um, you know, make it a good quality, if I can say that. Um, whereas if you if you look at a, something like a retailer, if you look at people who collect a lot of client data, 
they are the ones who have the real um, difficult jobs, I would say, because, you know, if you think about it, if, if you go into a shop and they ask you for your email address, you know, they want to send you a newsletter or something, you'd give your email address to them and then maybe you would go to another shop and you'd give them a different email address, you know, and, and if you go to different departments within an organization, you can give your work email, you can give your work cell phone number, um, you could give your personal cell phone number. So there's a lot of duplication out there. There's a lot of um, discrepancies, a lot of anomalies that these um, retailers, for example, need to now go through they need to validate it they need to bring it together they need to make sure it's correct and it's quite a difficult job um and and that brings me on to this thing of having a single source of truth so your single source of truth is basically this idea that there exists a place within an organization where your data sits and this data is used by everyone in the organization to um make a decision so okay. In other words, this has all been collected, this has all been cleaned, it's the, the, the best quality you're going to get and it's accurate and it's up to date. How easy is it to actually get to that? You know, because you've got different departments who have different ways of dealing with the data. You've got, um, you've got to have good data governance policies in place. You've got to have data ethics. Um, it also requires you to have certain machinery and tools in place. So there's a lot that actually goes into this. Um, so, so I think it's it's something to think about. And um, there's a lot of work that's always going on in the background. Um, and and you know that's why I always think in in our world and um, when we're actually getting this data that we've paid for. Um, we we're, we're a bit lucky i mean we still do need to do our own tests on our side which we still do um we've got transparent platforms we can view the data at any point in time and if we do have a question then we can go to the data provider and say okay why why is there a day missing um or we think this is wrong um you know and they they need to come back to us um with with some sort of response um so i think that that's how i sort of see the two industries differ um, and how I, I think I should stop complaining about how much time I spend looking at the data we work with. So, so it, it, uh, it, it feels to me like uh, the, it, we, we'll see some strange relationships with data and business because, uh, I, I mean, I, I remember listening to a company that sells car tracking systems. You know, they, they put those things in your car and if you get, uh, if you know, you get hijacked or the car gets stolen, they can track it and hopefully you find it before it's uh, dismantled. Uh, and listening to the CEO of that company uh, and, and, and his major growth path was not selling more tracking units in more cars. It, he, he says, we are now a data company. We can tell you about consumers, where they shop, because we know that we can tell you where they are. They spend X amount of time at this place. We know it's next to a mall. We know what the shop is at that mall. We know that from there, they go down the road to their favorite coffee shop. We can mm -hmm. tell you where they fill up their cars, all of those things. Not, not because they've got uh, uh, transaction data or something, but you can now start to link time in a car and particular patterns. And, and his view is we've got data that if we can build patterns and understand those things, that would become valuable to the beloved retailer who's got lousy data from their own customers because the customers are lying to them. It's people like me that don't even give my cell phone number yeah. email to the retailer. But, <laughs> Warren, so, I think, sorry to interrupt, but I think that's half the problem. We are actually half the problem. We need to be better at, you know, giving out more accurate data because there's someone on the other side that's going to use it and that needs to, um, you know, get some insight from what you're giving them. So, yeah, I mean, we're all, we all need to hold ourselves accountable. <laughs> The, the the data scientist telling the the the, the client <laughs> to trust the data scientist, and I'm going no, I'm I'm protecting my data. So so now you look at this and you go, okay, so here you've got a company that basically sells a widget, but actually it's accumulating enormous amounts of what could be really valuable data, uh, and, and then then and obviously you, you know the, the the data is not a catchphrase, but it is attractive to investors. So someone that's got big data and and quite clean quality data becomes much more attractive from an investment perspective than someone selling a fancy widget that gets hidden in your car somewhere. Uh, uh, so, so I get that that's one, but the one that really uh, interests me a lot, and I, I don't think they're capitalizing as much as they should, would be banks. 
because gee, I mean, they're, they're shopping, they're, they know how we shop. Even if we're sitting, you know, in our pajamas on a screen <laughs> shopping for, for our favorite dog food or whatever it is, looking at my dog while I say that, uh, or, or our fluffy slippers for winter, they know all of that stuff. They know when, they know how, they know who we're shopping with, all of that. Uh, and, and yet, you know, they make more money just on transaction, you know, fees mm. or interest or uh, th those things. And, and to me, you know, giving your data, which is what we do to, to a meta or a Google or whatever, we do that for free. They make enormous amounts of money. Here we've got a bank with a closed ecosystem that really, and we can't lie to the bank, right? They know us. They know where we live. They've done all that stuff. They, they really understand us. Uh, and, and I feel they're missing an enormous opportunity as the hardy dogs fly past. So, <laughs> so it, it, it's an interesting one where, where I look at winners, which could be a car tracking company and not a loser, but, but a company that's surely missing out on major opportunities being, being at least maybe some of the banks. Let's not be unfair to, to all banks, but, but yeah. I, want to, I want to circle that round. So, so are there weird kind of businesses that, that that could be real data powerhouses that we just don't think of and 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 actually you know they, they could be the future of, of of where new business goes so i think that in in this you know we're, we're in the fourth industrial revolution now um and and big data has been a thing i mean i know we only we've only heard of it um for the, in the past couple of years but big data has actually been around since the 1990s and the amount of data that we're generating every single day, it's, I mean, it's an incomprehensible amount. Um, and I think companies, companies do need to use this big data to generate insights. And it doesn't even, it doesn't matter like what industry you're from. I think in some way they are, you know, you should be doing it already. Um, and, and I think, Yes, the banks, um, they, they, you know, you could see that as they could be using uh, consumer data to maybe derive some insights from it. And they probably are, but they probably, you know, won't make this public. Um, they're probably using it internally. And this is, you know, I mentioned it before, um, how, you know, some industries would collect data themselves um, and they would need to sort through it and they would need to, you know, validate it and, and, um, basically make sure that it's making sense to use to create some insights. So you can be so creative with it. And, I, and that's why I think that, you know, every company should be making an attempt to actually use it. Um, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example of um, how you could maybe use it in a marketing sense. Um, you could maybe look at if someone comes onto your website, you know, you could ask them to log in, maybe put in their email address or something. And you could maybe track, you know, what they're clicking on, on your website. And that would then, you know, show you what is this person interested in? If you're a bank, you could look at, um, you know, what sort of credit cards are they looking at? And then you could maybe send them emails for, you know, the, the platinum credit card or the, I don't know, the gold credit card, you know? So it, 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 it creates this, um, you know, it creates this idea that you can have a better um, target um, for when, when you're advertising. And I think that's a really powerful tool because, you know, I would be a lot, it's like when you're shopping, you know, and, and you keep, you, you're searching for new sneakers. The next day you log onto your computer and now you've got these ads popping up when you're trying to read something on business day. And, you know, you've got sneakers everywhere. So, I mean, it's happening in the background and, and we might not be aware of it, but I definitely think that, you know, no matter what industry you're in, you can be really creative with it. And it's there for you to use, but you do also need to be really skeptical and, and responsible when you're using it as well. So I, I don't want to give uh, free advertising away to retailers, but but I noticed uh, with these little delivery bikes, my, my wife's my wife and I are kind of old school, so it took us a long time to get onto online shopping for food, uh, but but now now uh, now we're converted, and all of a sudden, you know, you you get your kind of shopping list that you've populated once, and you can use that again, and then it'll say to you, "Gee, well, you bought this item." For the last three weeks and this yeah. item goes really well with that item and that item yeah. and if you buy all three together we'll give you a bit of a discount uh, yeah. and it 
and for me, that's actually quite powerful because, f- firstly, they're right; those things go together, uh, and and secondly, it's I know from the retailer's point of view, it's encouraging us to spend a bit more with them. So you know, well done to them, but but mm. equally that we're getting a bit of a discount, so we feel like we're winning, and 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 there is some some convenience there, and I think. Uh, mm. You know that for me is where, where retailers are doing incredibly well. Once they've got you in their kind of e-commerce universe, uh, and 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 they they're getting my actual name and my actual address and and all that stuff, yeah. they start to understand us better. Um, yeah, I, I think I think what really freaks them out is I do the shopping sometimes, and my wife does the shopping yeah. sometimes, and that really confuses the the the, the machine. But but yeah. but I think that that for me is a, is a really interesting, valuable use, and and I guess. Streaming services, you know, uh, you know, talking about music, you know, you kind of when no one buys, no one buys a CD now, or you know, I mean, I, I know vinyl's coming back into fashion, but that's a whole different story. But but streaming services all of a sudden start to recommend things that you that you just didn't know before, you know, new bands, new songs, uh, and and to me that again, it's it's probably where where data is useful. What I need to yeah. ask you is, how does this relate? <laughs> To the world of money, how do how do investors uh, how are they looking at this and, and actually making money out of all of this? So I think I can definitely speak from a systematic perspective um, because we work in a systematic house. And just to quickly explain what that is, it it's basically this data driven approach, um, and and every decision that we make is based on evidence. So we don't make any decisions based on how we feel, um, any emotions, you know, it, it's very rational thinking um, and, and sort of, you know, keeps you, keeps you in line and, and keeps you aligned with your philosophy. Um, and, and I think that's really important because, you know, sometimes with, with fund managers, what can happen is that they can change their strategies a little bit depending on what's happening in the market. And I think yeah. what's, you know the beauty of of maybe a systematic house is that you are so rules based that you aren't really allowed to stray away from from your core philosophy um and and so so that's why data is so important to us data is at the core of everything that we do and you know we can use data in so many different ways um and that doesn't mean just looking at stock prices so for traditional traditional investment managers like um you know that look at fundamental data that look at balance sheets that look at um your ratios like p e ratios or price to book ratios we do use all of that, but we also add on alternative types of data so if we had to decide okay where where do where do we allocate money we can build a more holistic story or a more holistic view of where it's attractive and where it's not. So we can get data from different parts of the world, from the US, from China, from Europe. Um, and we can get data that speaks to sentiment. So you can look at, okay, how do consumers feel in different parts of the world? Um, how do they feel about, you know, we, we're obviously living in this inflationary, high inflationary environment. Is it difficult for consumers? And sometimes you'll find that what you read in the news is actually just noise because the data doesn't actually speak to it. And that's where you have to be very careful um, of, you know, just believing what you read. Um, we can also look at things like, you know, economic growth. Um, we can look at, oh, is this, is this, is the US growing above their trend growth or below? Um, what's happening in China right now? You know, so you can look at so many different angles that does, so it doesn't make you so one dimensional. And all we want, because I mean, I can't be in the US, I can't be in China, I can't be in Europe every single day. So what having access to this large amount of data allows me to do is actually to build the story every single day. And that allows us to go and see, okay, well, we think, for example, um, you know, the, the, we should allocate a bit more to the US right now because it's showing this strong case, not only on on um, on a valuations perspective per se, but also from, from the sentiment, from the economic picture um, and you and and this is where a lot of the work does come in so you can search for different um, different factors if you like so what what's quite a popular one um, is looking for sentiment on Twitter so if you analyze tweets if you analyze Google searches you can get a general sense of 
what people are thinking. So if people are Googling recession, um, you know, in interest rate hikes, you get a general sense that, okay, you know, people, people are worried. Um, and and that's something that that we we would incorporate um, through machine learning processes and and that sort of thing. Um, so I think you can be so creative, um, and that's what you have to remember. So so it uh, I, I guess there's two big themes there that that land for me. One is it is impossible for an ordinary human to be rational all the time. Uh, that, that that's called uh, a psychopath, I think. Uh, um, so, so let's say normal humans, uh, and and then secondly, it's impossible to to be as you say physically everywhere, but to read everything, uh, and and so that's what I'm taking out of what you're saying is one, you use uh, a methodology that 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 helps you to try and be as rational as you can in 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 as many circumstances as possible. Uh, and when we're at stage 72 of load shedding for the 700th day in a row, uh, that gets a bit harder, but then you use the methodology to kind of guide you back. And, yeah. and that's important, but, but equally that you're not basing your assumptions, but because I think a lot of investing is based on assumed relationships rather than uh, observed relationships. And I think, you know, so the psychologists have got terms for that. Let's not start a psychology lesson, yeah. but but you know there was one the one classic one is you know sell in may and go away and uh, you know whether that's true or not is is not not you don't find that out by listening to the 72 year old stockbroker you go and look at the relationships you actually go and look at what markets have done all around the world and not just once or not just five times but you've got to look at it over 50 or 100 years because sometimes it's just luck that something happens as opposed to a, a, an observable pattern. And I think that, mm -hmm. you know, listening to you now, that, that makes it clear to me. One, uh, making sure that you, that's why you're putting the emphasis on clean data. You don't want to get bad or dirty data, if that's right, or noisy data because it, it obscures something uh, that's not true or, or creates a pattern that's not true. And secondly, uh, the, then defining relationships. I know in the old days, you know, the American middle class kind of drove the world's economy for a long period of time. And now it could be that that's not the case. It's actually the Chinese middle class person that's actually driving the world's economy. But we don't know that. We, it's something we're guessing. It's it's the bright sparks like you who are going to look at this data and go, I can tell you for a fact that this is how it works. It's the Northwestern Chinese consumer and not the Southeastern American consumer, whatever it is. Uh, and, yeah. and so that's, that is powerful. But And I think together... It makes sense because what always worries me when we're talking about data and and let's say quantitative analysts is that they get too focused on the model uh, mm -hmm. and and what you're saying is actually those are tools uh, it's not that eventually we just blindly follow the model that says we've taken 74 million lines of data put it into an algorithm and the algorithm says buy and i just push and i close my eyes and push buy you're not doing that no <laughs> No, I Good. think lots of people would yeah. be worried, but people also like to make the joke that, oh, you know, you're a quant analyst, or you, you know, you can sleep easy at night and you don't have to worry. But um, we do actually need to be very involved in every single process, um, you know, from from collecting the data, from questioning where it comes from, from looking at the data, um, wrangling the data. And by wrangling, I don't mean I don't mean cleaning us, but I mean getting it into a form that we think is appropriate. And you've got to also be careful with that because you don't want to strip out the essential information that this data is actually telling you. So, you know, sometimes if data is quite um, quite noisy, you know, you can maybe plot it on a chart and say, you know, gosh, that looks that looks terrible. We can't put that in the model. Um, and what we'll try and do, we'll try to we'll try to remove these outliers. We'll try to smooth it, but we've got to remember that we can't actually take away the essence of what the dis of what the data is trying to tell us. Um, and then once we've, once we've understood that, then we've got to be very involved in what's going into the models because we program the models, you know, so we've got to know what limitations are we putting in? What um, statistical models are we using? And what assumptions are we making in these models? Are they correct for this type of uh, project? Um, and, and the outcome you've also got to, be skeptical about you know you can't just also just take that at face value you've got to say okay this makes sense um you know it's it's you've got there's always going to be a need for for humans and i think people people get a bit caught up and, and think that you know the robots are going to take over 
you know, we, we don't know that right now, but for now, yeah. I think we're pretty safe and there's always going, to, I mean, our jobs are going to change, but um, there will still always be a need for, for us. <laughs> I feel like too many people took those Terminator movies too seriously and, uh, and, and are now yeah. living with, uh, with uh, excessive fear. Uh, Shreya, we, we've, uh, we, we've blown through our time. So the, the, the conversation has been really interesting for me at least. And thank you very much. But I've got to ask you my favorite uh, trick question for new guests. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, if you could look back and, and meet with the experience you've got now, meet your 18 year old self, let's say, what would be the one lesson you would love to impart to your 18 year old self? Um, so I think I might get a bit philosophical here, but Great. Um, there's, I like it. There's, <laughs> there's a quote I heard, um, and it's by a guy who's a, he's a clinical psychologist. His name is Jordan Peterson. Um, and he said that if you don't say what you think, then you kill your unborn self. It's quite, it's a bit dark, <laughs> but I think it's, yeah, it really got the message across for me because I think, you know, you've got to, you've got to express your opinions. You've got to express your ideas, your thoughts and be your authentic self. I think if you don't do that, you become quite lost and you start to do yourself a disservice. And I think that, you know, sometimes you might be wrong, but you can't be afraid to be wrong um, because that's how you develop and how you grow. Um, and I think it's so essential to to engage with people um, on this level, you know, because that's what breeds creativity. Um, and if you think about it, if you think about businesses, businesses who have people that are, you know, don't are, are not trying to always play it safe, are not always trying to be on the right side, say the right thing you know, that, that breeds this creativity that could give them a competitive edge. So you can think about it in a business context, or you could think about it, you know, in your personal life. Um, you, you, you just got to be who you are, say what you think. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's something that I would love to have at the back of my mind. <laughs> Uh, I must say that's such a powerful message and you know in, in the world of echo chambers which is kind of where we live now you know there's not a lot of there are not a lot of people who are willing to have an original thought uh, and and actually mm -hmm. do the work to to think for themselves and then express a, a genuine opinion I think what happens mm -hmm. now is lots of people take garbage and regurgitate that garbage straight out as as um, as loudly and as brashly as they can simply because they live in this echo chamber and and I think that's important, you know, is, is in a world like we've got now, uh, we need to be thinking for ourselves and consuming, um, you know, as much information that we don't necessarily agree with as, our, mm -hmm. as we can. Because, you know, speaking to the only, only to the people you agree with doesn't help you learn a thing. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a powerful point, Shreya. Shreya Roy <laughs> from uh, Pre Prescient, thank you so much. Uh, it was really fun to have you on the show. I was quite skeptical that we were going to be down the, the, the jargon rabbit hole, but we, we skipped all of that. And, and actually, I think uh, I've, I've learned something, which, is, which means I'm sure that our, our clever listeners have as well. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Warren. Brought to you by Prescient Investment Management. Informed by science. Guided by insight. Prescient Investment Management is an authorized FSP.